Okay, so welcome everyone to the presentation. Um, I'm Jeff Adest and Sandy Jensen. Uh, I'm so many of you have heard us speak before. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. We are here today to talk to you about the FTCA application. Uh, as in the past, the slides and the recording will be sent out to you after the presentation, so you don't need to be sitting and taking little pictures of the screen. Um, if you want to submit questions, you can submit them through the Q&A or the chat box at the bottom, either one of those, um, and we will try to answer them at the end or as we're going along. The application this year is substantially similar to how the application was in the past, um, with the caveat that Actually, they made it a little bit easier in some aspects because this year, instead of having actually having to submit policies for many of the questions, you have to answer yes or no, say that you do it, sort of certify that you're doing it. Uh, of course, that comes with you know positives and negatives because you certify yes, and then they come back and do a OSV or an FTCA site review, and you don't have it, you're going to run into problems. So, obviously, you still need to be doing the same things you were doing in the past. Um, as far as our presentation, like in the past, uh, you know, Sandy is going to walk you through most, most of the details and I'll jump in with comments here or there. I will say that I don't know how many of you had this over the past couple of years because I, I think that we think there was a, a, a you know, slowdown or stoppage over the past couple of years, but HRSA is now starting to do FTCA reviews again. Besides doing the regular OSBs, they are starting the, the FTCA reviews, which is something that you want to avoid at all costs because they are very difficult to deal with, right? If there's an FTC, right? If you if you sat through a regular OSB, then you know that they're there for you know basically two days plus, and risk management and credentialing and all that is a small piece of maybe you know. 20% of the overall OSV, if you have an FTCA review, then they're coming and spending 100% of two days on these three or four topics. And they are drilling down to a much, much more detailed level. Uh, we are not going to sit and talk a lot about FTCA reviews today. We'll mention some things that they may come up on the reviews. But I will tell you that if you are going to have an FTCA review, I strongly recommend that you work with someone who's been through them. That someone could be us because we've sat through FTCA reviews, actually been in person for them, or it could be somebody else. But preparing for that is a real bear. Um, okay, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Sandy to start walking through the details. Okay, great. So um this year like every other year you have to submit for new fqhc's an original de deeming or an annual redeeming application um applications are due july 8th so we have a little bit uh, a month or so with respect to vhps so your volunteers are not covered under your ftca coverage however in prior years you could submit an application to have specifically named volunteers covered under FTCA. So this year, um, I'm not sure if, if you watched the technical webinar for this year's FTCA that HRSA gave, but they gave an update on the VHP program. And they said that it was going to expire unless Congress reauthorized it. And I last Yesterday, I think I checked the website and they didn't issue um, an application process for VHPs. So, so far the status is still unclear to me. So, you know, your VHPs could be ending this year, um, but we'll have to keep an eye on it. So why are we submitting an application? If you have FTCA coverage, if the FQHC is subject to a malpractice um, or health-related claim, they could be covered under the FTCA. Uh, employees of FQHCs and some contractors, it's very limited, but this is mostly for employees, would be deemed federal employees qualified under FTCA and their malpractice liability insurance and any coverage for the claim would be provided by the federal government. Right. So, 
Uh-huh. Sorry, just to jump in for one second, because we get this question a lot. If you are contracting with a third party, not directly with a provider, you're contracting with a hospital, a medical group, anything like that, for them to provide you with staff, those staff will not be covered under FCCA. The only carve-outs for contractors are if you're contracting directly with Dr. Smith, who comes in you know, one session every two weeks, and you're paying him or her on a 1099 basis, and they're in primary care, then theoretically they'll be covered. But it, it's very limited. If you have any of those situations, I would say you reach out to us. I mean, we could talk to you offline, but it, it, it's a very unusual to have coverage for a contract. Exactly. So if there's a lawsuit related to um, an action by a provider that's employed by the F3C or in the limited situation that Jeff was referring to with contractors. The lawsuit is, is against the federal government. It's not even against the FQHC. So there's real benefits to having coverage under the FTCA. So as, oops, as Jeff was mentioning, um, this year, like last year, there's many yes or no questions. This year, they made it a little bit easier with respect to Q&A, which we'll talk about. Um, But you actually, if you're attesting that you have policies and procedures in place, you actually have to have them in place. And if if you're saying, yes, we have operating procedures that um, say that we conduct all of these assessments, you actually have to be doing that because these are things that you can't put in place, like your assessments. This year, you don't have to submit quality assurance assessments, but you actually have to be doing them on at least a quarterly basis. It's not something that if you get notice of an OSB, you can come up with quickly. So just keep in mind, those attestations actually mean something. So um, the FTCA application is broken down into four sections. Again, this is very similar to last year, risk management, QIQA, credentialing and privileging, and claims management. It asks whether you have any conditions on your award related to certain sections. And if you do, they indicate that, you know, it could affect whether you're in compliance with FTCA program requirements. And again, it must be signed by the executive director CEO. So we'll start with risk management because that in QA, um, it to me seems to be the hardest sections. So you have to have a risk manager in place that's responsible for your risk management program. Uh, The risk manager has to complete annual healthcare risk management training. Um, You have to upload a certificate showing that training was completed within the last 12 months. You have to upload the risk manager's uh, position description. And the description has to describe the risk management activities that the risk manager is responsible for. And it has to state that risk management activities are part of the daily responsibilities of the risk manager. So they want those words in there that the daily responsibilities of the risk manager include risk management activities. So you have to attest that you have a risk management program um, to reduce risk. And so, I mean, if you think about it, they're providing you with malpractice insurance for your providers. And if there's a medical malpractice claim, it's against the federal government. So they want to see that you're minimizing risk. So there's less claims against the federal government. So some of the things that your program um, must address is uh, risk management across the full range of activities. So triage, scheduling, missed appointments, intake, tracking. So a little bit about these patient management activities. If you were subject to an FTCA specific site visit, they would want to see writ, um, policies on all of these areas. So, you know, they're looking for how you address risk with respect to these areas. So, no show appointments policy, for example. So, when I see these policies, it's usually if a, if a patient um, misses three appointments, then we can determine um, that we will discharge the patient from our practice. That's not what HRSA is looking for. They're looking for, is there something wrong with the patient um, that 
is preventing the patient from coming into the health center. For example, is it a chronic care patient? They were supposed to come in uh, and fail to come in. Was there follow-up to determine whether something was wrong and whether you know the patient maybe had an episode at home and someone should check in on the patient? Or phone triage. If someone calls in and says, you know, I have heart palpitations, I have pain down the left side, is your front desk staff saying, well, we're all booked today? Um, or are they, um, is there a list of symptoms where they know they should maybe get a provider or transfer it to, to a nurse right away? Walk in patient policy. Do you have appointments available in the schedule each day to allow for walk in patients with urgent needs? So, I mean, things to consider really with, with the idea that they're trying to address risk in, in every area of the health center. So your program also has to include risk management training for all staff, including non-clinical staff. I'm sorry, Sandra, just to jump in for a second. So just to be clear, so we don't get a lot of questions about this, technically for FTCA, this FTC application, you do not have to have all the policies that are in this bullet that Sandy just went through. If you have an FTCA site visit, they will require. So if you don't have any of these and it's going to be impossible for you to do them in the next month, you don't have to worry that you will not be able to still be eligible for FTCA. But if, if you don't have them in writing, it's a good idea to start putting them in writing or at least make sure you have some procedures for dealing with each of these. So if you have to put it in writing, you won't be starting completely from scratch. Right, exactly, exactly. So um, part of your program has to include quarterly risk manage man management assessments and annual reporting to the board. So as part of the application, again, like all previous PALs that I've been involved with, you have to upload your tracking policies so we'll start with hospital tracking. So HRSA requires that you track um, hospital admissions for patients that were sent from the health center to the hospital. So the elements that you should track is the patient information, who the patient is, date of admission or visit, you know, why you sent the patient to the hospital and what you received back because they're looking for a continuity of care um, situation. Like you, you sent the patient to the hospital, the patient was released and you're looking at the documents to see um, what happened and what kind of follow-up is required. So you must follow up with the hospital and or patient to again, to find out what happened with the patient and get any information that you can on um, uh, diagnosis or treatment or what happened. In your policies, you have to identify the staff members responsible for following up or tracking could be a medical assistant um, or some sort of, you know, care manager. Um, so there's one thing in, in the PAL, and every year the, the PAL says your hospital tracking policies um, track hospitaliza hospitalization of patients sent from the FQHC or those that entered on their own. But the compliance manual changed, that was a longstanding requirement but that was changed by the compliance manual. And the compliance manual specifically um, indicated that they were changing that because they saw it was burdensome to require a, an FQHC to follow patients who went into the hospital on their own. So the PAL, the wording makes it seem like you have to track um, hospital admissions that were initiated by the patient. But when we followed up with HRSA, they also agreed that it only applied to those that were um, ordered by the FQHC. So referral tracking policy. Like hospital tracking, they're looking for continuity of care. So if you have to refer a patient to a specialist, when do you expect that evaluation or the report to be received? Um, and if you don't receive it by that, that date or time period, they expect follow-up either with the patient or the specialist to make sure that you get the report. And then you know whether you know, treatment has to be changed or appropriate course of treatment. 
So you have to include certain things in your policy. For example, did the patient call and ask for the referral or was the doctor referring? Also, um, you know, is it an urgent referral where you expect the visit to occur within a week or so and expect the, the report back within a couple days of that? Or is it a routine referral? How was it initiated? Again, was it, you know, did the provider send it to a medical assistant and the medical assistant provided the referral to the patient? Do you have um, the referral department handle it? And then what is the follow-up? How often do you attempt to follow up and obtain the results? So the elements are listed. Um, again, they want to see that the tracking policy includes, you know, follow-up efforts, including follow-up with the patient. Is the reason why um, you haven't received anything back related to patient compliance? And if so, can you have staff? for example, um, attempt to help the patient make the appointment if the patients are responsible for making their own appointment. I just to jump in for a second before the next slide because I'm seeing some questions. Yes, we will be sending out the recording and the slides after the presentation. Okay, so um, the last tracking policy is the diagnostic. So this includes lab and radiology. Um, the tracking elements are listed. It includes like when it was ordered, follow-up, provider who reviewed the results, and the last bullet, communication of results to the patient. So HRSA is very, very um, particular about this. All results have to be communicated back to the patient. So including normal results, and we know this is we know because we've heard it a lot that this is burdensome um, for some health centers, but it is a requirement. Um, so for normal results, there has to be a process to communicate it to a provider, verification that the results are within appropriate range. So the provider has to say that's normal, that's fine, communicate it to the patient, um, and then document that you, you attempted to communicate it to the patient. So it could be a phone call. It could be sending something to the patient's home. If the patient uses a patient portal, um, you can send the results through there. If there's a next scheduled visit, you can communicate the results at the next scheduled visit. For abnormal results, same type of thing. Like what is the time frame for communicating to the patient? So this is abnormal. It is a few business days you know, sufficient for this abnormal result, whatever you determine is medically appropriate for communicating abnormal results should be in your um, policy. And then what efforts, including date time, that should all be tracked. Right, so again, to just to add what Sandy said, person doesn't say what's considered to be abnormal or critical or anything like that. You can define that. And so not every web could see has to have the same standards for that. The same thing going back to the, you know, some of the other tracking and things like that, you could have standards for how you do it, right? So you have a patient who came in, who's supposed to be going for an MRI or an MRI, and you call the patient, you could have in there that we, we check with the patient once, right? You could also have, if you want, that we can check with the patient nine times. The point being, it's up to you to define your parameters for how, for, at what point you consider the loop to be closed. Right, that's a great point. And the tracking elements, those are the um, elements that they said you must track, but how you implement that within your policy, within your um, FQHC, again, it's up, to, it's up to you. So for critical results, you have to ensure that if the provider is out, there's a backup provider um, covering that so that there's no delay in reading the results. Then you have to, make sure that you contact the results to their, you um, inform the patient of the results. So, um, you know, in one FTCA specific site visit, I think the policy said, if we're not able to contact the patient that day, we would consider a home visit. And they required that the policy be, re be revised to say, if you're not able to contact the patient by telephone that day, 
you will make a home visit or you will contact you know your local health department or or the police for them to make a home visit so they're really looking at um, making sure that when you have critical results, you take immediate action and the patient is notified right away. So um, you have to attest that you have implemented risk management operating procedures. So that's your, your program that we were talking about um, earlier. And that's identifying areas of highest risk. So how do you do that? In most cases, that's based on services that are provided. High-risk areas include OBGYN, dental, anything that involves like um, more complicated procedures or could you know, raise the risk of infection. And then you mitigate those high areas by you know, making sure all the standards of care, standards of practice are met um, and medical staff supervision where appropriate. You have to document, analyze, and address like incidents, which include near misses. They're very, very, um, they're, they're, they take a high importance on near misses. And near misses are incidents that, things that didn't rise to the level of an incident because somehow it was prevented from occurring. So it was almost an incident, something almost happened. You almost gave um, the wrong patient uh, the the wrong vaccine, but something happened to prevent you from doing that. That's considered a near miss that you have to kind of, you know, make sure you, you uh, track, you talk about why it happened and steps to avoid it in the future. You have to set and track risk management. Goals. Wait, wait, one second. I just want to talk about the near misses for a second. Okay. So we speak about this a lot and we do risk management training at FQHCs and everyone's natural, natural inclination when you screw up is to try to hide it and hope no one finds it, right? HRSA is looking for exactly the opposite and you really need to train people on this. They want to be able to see that there were problems and you, you know, or near problems and you fix them, right? HRSA has said to us on many occasions that if I come into a large FQHC, and at the end of the year, I look and there were no near misses or misses, then I believe that there is not an effective risk management uh, and quality assurance program because it's virtually impossible for that to happen, right? So, you know, some, some classic examples like San Sandy mentioned is you prescribe a medication for the, for the patient and it turns out they're taking something else that would be interfere with, you know, with this medication and, you, and you, the pharmacist calls you and says, are you really sure you want to give this medication? Right. Another example that comes up, uh, unfortunately, not infrequently, is you have two John Smiths, right? And you, and you go and you're treating one and you enter it, the information into the wrong chart, into the other John Smiths. Or you have a, a, you know, a parent who comes in with a, a five-year-old and a six-year-old, and you really can't tell them the difference between them. And you think you're treating the five-year-old, and it turns out you're treating the six-year-old and you put the information in the wrong chart, or you're about to put the information in the wrong chart. When you get to year end, I imagine the people on this phone include many risk managers or quality managers or quality assurance directors. If you have nothing to report in, in any of these categories, then I think you have a problem. If you can have an FTCA review and you have nothing to report, they are not gonna believe you. And so uh, I know that it's not you specifically who, who this is happening to. You need to go back and talk to your staff about reporting these things and, and constantly remind them about it. This might be the, one of the most important things that we're talking about today. Right. And similarly, like um, patient complaints and grievances, like it, it's very um, unrealistic that no patient would complain or, you know, file a grievance. It could be that you know, you, they're very informally handled and they're minor, but, you know, year after year, if I see that there's no patient grievances or complaints, it would, it starts getting me to think that maybe there is no, you know, grievance process, or at least it's not communicated to the patient. So that could be a red flag too. Um, your operating procedures have to include annual 
healthcare risk management training and establishment of a risk training plan um, and the report to the board. And we'll talk about these. So your training, there's certain required trainings and they're listed and your training plan has to be uploaded as part of your FTCA application. So health centers have a risk management plan and that outlines all of your operating procedures that we talked about, all of the things that you have to, um, activities that you have to do as part of your risk management program for your center. Separately, you need a risk management training plan that outlines the courses that your staff are going to take, how you're going to track it, who has to take what, what happens if you have staff that aren't in compliance, so these are the required courses. For obstetrical procedures, if you do prenatal or postnatal um, services, you have to have some training as well. It's not just for um, centers that do labor and delivery. Okay. Right, and, and very often, right, that, that's, a, that's not a, a training that you'll easily be able to provide, but very often the hospitals where they do the deliveries will have that training, and so you, you could have contract for the training, it doesn't have to be done directly. But I, I will say that if you are looking for risk management type training, um, we have that training available. We offer you know, training, like I mentioned before, we regularly do training for clients. And nowadays, given Zoom, right, all those things can be done virtually instead of having to be done in person. So we definitely could help you with that. One more, I just thought of one thing about training too. Um, if you look at the PAL, it says, you know, show us your tracking tools for the risk management training that you've done for clinical staff and non-clinical staff. So it's not just your providers, it's your general staff. Like, for example, um, your front desk, they would probably do the HIPAA confidentiality requirement trainings. Um, how many people have gone to a doctor's office and they'll say, okay, is your date of birth still this, you know, are you here for this? And they're disclosing like your medical information and your confidentiality right there. So, um, you know, this is for clinical and non-clinical staff. Right. And, and I should mention, I'm sorry to keep uh, pushing on this, but we have training, separate trainings for clinical staff and non-clinical staff. We also can record for you. So, uh, there's many of FQHCs now where any new any new uh, staff member gets to see a video of me talking about risk management and throw things at the screen. Okay. Um, so as part of risk management, you have to upload your training plan. So again, that's different than your operating procedures for your entire risk management program. They're only looking for your training plan and your tracking documentation. So. Your tracking documentation would be, you know, the easiest in my mind is like an Excel spreadsheet that lists all your staff and then the applicable training for them and the date they took it. So they want to see that, you know, in this 12 month period that all of your staff have received training. Um, also, you have to upload documentation that the risk manager completed training. And these could be, you know, through ECRI. I know ECRI has different levels of training. You only have to complete one, one of their trainings and they issue a certificate of completion. You just upload that. So you also have to upload risk management assessments. So these are quarterly um, reviews of your risk management activities and they could include data trends, they could be in reports. Um, if you have a risk management committee or if risk management is incorporated as, as part of your QIQA committee, it could be those committee meeting minutes where you're talking about risk management um, activities or issues. And they have to be reflective of the last 12 months. So a little bit about governing board requirements. So your risk management assessments, you know, your training should re be reported to the board because the board has to oversee the risk management program. 
where they have to know what's going on in relation to risk. They approve the risk management plan. They have to receive an annual report. Um, and this, this actually has to be uploaded too as part of the FTCA application. So the annual report talks about what happened with respect to risk management activities and trends and data throughout the year. So they've, you've been sending them your quarterly assessments, but now you're summarizing it all in this annual report. Um, you have to give the board the opportunity to make any recommendations on follow-up. Uh, they also, you have, you also have to upload meeting minutes that shows that the annual report was submitted to the board uh, and it has to be um, reviewed by the board. So your meeting minutes should say the annual report risk, the annual risk management report was submitted to the board, discussion ensued, if there was any re relevant um, discussion and the board minutes have to be signed. All right, well, I just, just one thing on board minutes, and, and we're going to talk about this some more next week in our, in our uh, webinar about OSBs, but we very often find that it just says that there was a, a presentation to the board. It doesn't talk about the board discussing it. it doesn't, the minutes don't talk about the board approving it. Even if they say it was approved, it's still nothing about discussion. HRSA wants to see some discussion about it, so when you're preparing your minutes, make sure that gets into the minutes. Great. So um, every year we give an FTCA application um, webinar. And this year we wanted to uh, just change it up a little bit because we review FTCA applications and we review all the documents for the OSBs. And we kind of see um, not a pattern, but we see similar um, issues coming up with respect to documents related to the FTCA requirements. So we kind of wanted to give some examples of how you can tweak your documents or things that should go into a document. There, these are not um, how you must have it done. These are just examples. There's some reports that I've seen or assessments that I've seen that are way different than this that are fantastic. This is just one way to kind of um, put thoughts in your head of, okay, how for, how am I going to structure it in my health center to make sure that all the information is included that I have to include? So we'll start with quarterly risk assessment. So every three months, you have to do something related to risk management. You have to do some sort of presentation and it has to be documented because you'll need this for the FTC application and you'll need it for an OSB if um, you're due for one. It has to go to the board. So it can either be in meeting minutes, um, and I had said, if you have a separate risk management committee, that's fine. Or if you have a QA committee with a risk management component, you can incorporate into that. You can do a report. You can do quarterly risk management, risk assessment reports, that's fine but it has to be a quarterly documented review of risk management activities. It should include, the, these are some of the things that it should include. It should include your risk management goals because at the end of the year, you have to talk about, um, did you meet those goals? And so the idea is that at these quarterly assessments, you're looking at your goals and saying, is there anything that I should tweak to help me meet my goals? Are, are things that I'm putting in place working towards increasing or meeting my goals? You should talk about incidents near misses that, that Jeff and I were talking about. Any claims that occurred during that quarter. Um, patient satisfaction is a big one for risk management, but also for QIQA. So are patients dissatisfied about something? Are they more likely not to come and get um, services because they're unhappy with how they were treated in you know, the internal medicine department? Are your tracking policies working? Did you go and check the logs to make sure that um, they're up to date? Infection control is really big. And if you have an FTCA specific site visit, they'll wanna see that you're periodically surveying or monitoring to make sure that staff are following hand hygiene, 
and um, you know everything is stacked and you um, have enough PPE. Other issues that you can talk about. So these are these are ideas that you can talk about. There could be other specific to your FQAC. For example, you know, did you have some incidents with um, improper HIPAA? This, you know, HIPAA issue because you disclosed records. So you could talk about that. You know, did you inspect your sterilization um, equipment? Was there training scheduled and or you completed specialized trainings? So all of these should be, or not all of these. So risk management assessments have to be done quarterly and you have to talk about it um, and document it and then make sure it goes to the board. Right, so just a couple of points about that before we go on. Number one is, if you are not doing it already, you should be, when you have your quality assurance meetings, you should, the title of those meetings should be quality assurance and risk management, right? Even if you separate those out and you actually have two separate departments that deal with it, you should call both of them, both of them, so that they could qualify for both of these because very often we come back and, and especially risk, look for risk and there's very few things that say risk and there's a, you know you have good quality so you need to if you if you call it both and you sort of get credit in both buckets the second thing is that we have found on many occasions that you have a very FQHCs have a very robust uh, quality assurance program and when it comes to the board what happens is you report to the board you don't give them all the details you report on highlights but then in the highlights, you don't have enough information to cover HRSA's requirements. So even though you did it, HRSA doesn't give you credit for it. So our recommendation is that when you give it to the board, when you give the presentation to the board, you tell them, look, I'm giving you highlights, but attached to the minutes or attached to the board package is gonna be the actual minutes from the QA meeting that has you know, a lot more detail for them to be able to look at. And then you include that in your minutes so now when HRSA asks you for evidence at the board, so that you can pull the, the overall conversation and pull the minutes that were attached to the board package and be able to provide it to them. And just one other thing on HIPAA, right? So I know that everyone is sick and tired of hearing about HIPAA and I agree with it, but if you, are, if you do have HIPAA incidents, Right? So people tend to think of HIPAA as being a separate bucket. Right? If, you, if you sent the patient record to the wrong patient, Right, you have some some kind of breach like that. Don't forget to include it in your risk management. Right, you have to notify OCR about it anyway, so it's getting out there anyway. But people often forget and just keep it in their HIPAA bucket and don't and forget about putting it into their risk management bucket. And that's you know you're, you're again you're losing credit for something you're doing anyway. So make sure you include those. Okay, so I kept changing the slide back so that. This wouldn't be on the screen before I could explain it. So these are examples of, you know, word. These are examples of describing um, risk management activities that you're doing. But, you know, just a disclaimer. Some of these are two sentence long because it's one slide and I had to fit a whole bunch of things in one slide. Like, um, it, I, you have to describe in sufficient detail what you're doing. And just because I have two sentences here doesn't mean that's all you have to do. Like sometimes I've given examples and I'll see minutes that will have um, no issues noted. And it's like, well, but you have to, you have to talk about, you know, what you looked at, you know, what, what did you do? What did you look at? How did you arrive that, you know, in finding that everybody was in compliance with something? So these are just, you know, very, very brief uh, risk management activities. And, um, you know, to put in your idea, to put in your, your head, like what, um, kinds of descriptions um, you can build on from here. So one thing I wanted to point out was progress in meeting annual risk management goals. So goal one, this is something that you started in the beginning of the year, right? So goal one, decrease wait times. For whatever reason, um, in an FTCA specific site visit, HRSA wanted to say goal one progress. 
So that, that's why it's said like that. So they want to see goal one and goal one progress. How are you at the end of that quarter? So, you know, you're looking at your patient satisfaction. Are they satisfied with the wait times in pediatrics? You know, if not, what can you do about it? What can you implement in quarter two or quarter three? You know, talk about it, like brainstorm things that you can do. Um, you know, infection control, again, for the reasons I previously stated, it's very important. For an FTCA site visit, they'll, they'll look that you're maintaining logs of, um, you know, your surveys or monitoring. But what, what I tried to, um, you know, capture in these explanations was that you're reporting on, you know, what you found, and then what are you going to do about it? You know, for patient satisfactions, grievances, you know, you received two patient complaints related to courtesy. So you looked at the complaint, you talked to the relevant people, and then you just reminded front desk staff that, um, you know, they have to be courteous to the patients. So, you know, again, these are just examples. It's really um, just starting points on how to develop good minutes or reports. And these are not all the topics that you can include, or you don't have to include all of these topics, but you know, you could tailor to, to your health center. The second thing you have to upload and um, you know, documentation that we review that sometimes um, isn't as detailed as HRSA wants is the risk management annual report. This year, they wanted everyone to know that you can't just take your four quarterly risk assessments, staple them together, and send that in as your annual report. They want a report that looks at all the qu uh, quarterly assessments and summarizes the data. So it'll say, okay, in quarter one, this happened, and we took you know, these actions, and by quarter three, we improved or you know, complaints decreased. And they love graphs and charts because they want to make it easy for the board to review and digest. So this, um, they listed out certain topics that should be included. Are there for you? So here's an again. This is this is an example um, for incidents. I've listed a couple of incidents. You know, where were you on each quarter with respect to the incident, and then like give a little summary about it. So here I said, you had three needle stick injuries in quarter one. You looked at the issue, staff were retrained on appropriate needle stick and your needle stick injuries went down by quarter four. Since you still had five by the end of the year, one of your goals going forward could be decrease in needle stick injuries. If you have multiple sites, I've seen um, charts like this that that are broken down by site. So site one and then the incidents reported. So then you could, you could also see or the board can see if there's more um, incidents in one site compared to the other and you know should, should something more training happen in a particular site. Your annual risk management report, um, again, going back to the list of topics that HRSA wants to see included. So for, for me, if HRSA wants to see um, a list of topics, when I help um, draft the report, I list those topics as headings because then I know that everything will be um, captured in the report. So, you know, training. All staff have been trained. Talk about your training. Were there any specialized training for departments with high risk? So, you know, the OBGYN department, the STOSHA drills were held, EFM training was uh, provided. The dental equipment sterilization team was trained. You know, talk about your infection control. You know, if there were any trends, you could talk about trends. Um, in this case, I said they, you know, you monitored on hand hygiene and certain departments received retraining. Patient grievances and complaints, you don't have to um, list out specific complaints. You can say like a summary, you received four complaints in the um, area of courtesy, three in wait time, 
two in provider relations. Same thing with satisfaction. You know, they like to, see, again, they like to see charts and trends. So um, another area that you have to include in the re report is your status. And again, going back to that FTCA site visit, you know, this is how they like to see it laid out. Goal one, here's the goal, goal one result. In this case, we did a good job. We accomplished the goal. And then um, you have to lay out goals for the next year. And they could be based on your patient satisfaction surveys. They could be based on your grievances. You know, um, I always go to courtesy because that seems to be a big area that the patients complain about. And it could be maybe in the dental department, they had um, more complaints about courtesy. So increased patient satisfaction in courtesy in the dental department. Because if they're unhappy with the services, they'll, they'll not show up for appointments, they won't get services. And it, the, goal, the goal is, uh, the goal should be something that you can achieve. It shouldn't be something so far beyond um, realistic uh, goals that, that you're just, you're not gonna be able to do that. Okay, so we're gonna move on to quality um, improvement, quality assurance. I'm gonna go a little bit quickly because we only have 12 minutes and I wanted to talk about documentation with respect to this as well. So this year they made it easy. You're really not uploading anything for QIQA, you're just attesting. So, you know, that makes me a little nervous because the QI assessments I find are, are problematic. Um, so you have to make sure that you're doing it, even though you don't have to upload them this year, they're really important. And if you had, a, a, if you had an OSV, not an FTCA specific OSV, we'll look at them and it'll be a big part of the OSV. So your operating procedures have to include Similar things as risk management, so patient satisfaction, patient grievances, you know, and here they're looking at the quality of the services being provided. Again, we talked about this here. It no longer requires uploading the QIQA report to the board, um, job description, uh, QIQA assessments. You have to make sure they're being done. So the QIQA assessments, they're looking at whether providers are following standards of care, standards of practice, um, and any identification of patient safety or adverse events. The compliance manual clarified that QI assessments are done by physicians or other licensed healthcare professionals under the supervision of a physician and pulling patient data from patient records to look for compliance with standards of practice. So when first reviewers come in, they're looking for peer review. And peer review is um, a review of patient records by a peer, so a physician looking at a physician's records to determine whether the appropriate standard of care was met. Was the diagnosis correct? You know, were the standards of practice met? Did they treat this patient in accordance with generally accepted medical standards. Um, HRSA clarified that peer review is different than chart audits. So chart audits are when you look at charts and see, did the patient sign? Um, are all immunizations up to date? Or do they have a patient consent? That's different than peer review. And I know that, um, some health centers use something different, uh, not necessarily peer review. In all, in all of our OSVs, um, in our experience, they are, they're looking for peer review. This is what they want to see. So for, um, there's other questions you have to answer yes or no related to your EHR system and protecting confidentiality. So um, even though you don't have to upload your quality assessments, I just wanted to talk about them uh, because I see for OSB prep, you know, these sometimes are lacking. So, you know, 
for quality assurance, uh, your meeting minutes. There's never a problem with like UDS type performance measures. There's always like pages and pages of that, like a great job with that. But then with the FTCA and, and the HRSA compliance manual requirements, for example, patient satisfaction, patient grievances, you know, the QIQA assessments, sometimes, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time focusing on quality and then these areas aren't discussed. So at least quarterly, you should be talking about these areas, definitely patient satisfaction. And if you're incorporating your risk management into your quality assurance meetings, you're, you're handling it there. So you're, you're kind of addressing it because you're doing risk management too. Um, the QIQA assessment. So again, if you're doing peer review, you should just have a, something on the agenda that says QIQA assessment. Talk about what peer review was, was done, you know, how many providers were assessed, whether the standards of care were found to be met. You know, if you have evaluation forms, HRSA wants to see that the board is informed of these things. You could say, you know, results, or if you do a summary or a chart or something, attach it to your minutes and make sure it goes to the board. They specifically want to see that your QIQA assessments are going to the board. Um, and this is a requirement too for your operating procedures that you're producing and sharing reports. So, okay, so um, just, just, my, just like my disclaimer about risk management, you know, this is, you could do it any way you want. This is just an example of how you can lay things out and what kinds of, you know, thoughts should go into build, or building on something like this. But as you can see, it talks about quarterly assessments and then, you know, some questions you can ask um, to kind of build on, build on or to include. So credentialing and privileging is, a, is an area that changed this year. So there's certain credentialing and privileging requirements that you have to attest to, but you also have to submit your um, policies and procedures. This is, these are the elements that are required to be in your policies and procedures. Please remember that it has to include other clinical staff um, unless you absolutely do not use other clinical staff. Then your policy should say, you know, this health center does not use OCSs. And other clinical staff are your unlicensed staff because they're not required to be licensed by your state. So for example, some states require dental assistants and medical assistants to be licensed. Um, in other states, they are not required to be licensed. So depending on your state, you can have OCSs or you could not. Oh, um, Jeff, did you yeah. wanna talk about yeah, that? Yeah, so this is, this is uh, we just finished an OSV last week where HRSA has taken a position that we think is definitely new and seems to contradict, at least on its face, the HRSA chart that they put out about credentialing. And their, their position is that anybody, you know, including the OCSs, you have to be doing a National Practitioner Data Bank query for, regardless of whether or not they're licensed. Even if they're unlicensed, you still have to be doing it. And they're also taking the position that you have to, they have to have BLS training for those people as well. Uh, both of those things, I think, do not make much sense to us, but we, as part of that OSB, we actually pushed back and they went up to food chain to her son, asked the question to policy, and policy said yes. So I think at this point, you probably need to do it to be safe. Right. They want everybody to have BLS and everybody to be, um, to go through the query. Okay, so I'm going to skip to um, what is new this year. So this year, a credentialing list has to be provided. So this includes all of your clinical staff, including your contracted employees. So if you remember um, from the requirements for credentialing, you can, if you contract with an organization um, where they provide you providers, you can put in your contracts that 
they'll do the credentialing and they're assuring to you that they're providing you with providers who have been credentialed and privileged according to processes that meet applicable law. So, and in that case, all you have to do was, you know, say these are contracted during the OSB. They're, the um, contracting entity is handling credentialing and privileging. Here's our employees who we do. But this year, they want you to provide them with a list. And these are the elements that are included on the list. Um, the type of clinical staff, most recent credentialing date, and most recent privileging date. Now, that didn't make sense to me, so I um, contacted them. And what they said was, you know, that the most recent credentialing date is the date when the full activities were completed. So, for example, um, in June, you know, in June 22, you um, did a full, the provider was up for renewal, you did a, a full review of all the credentials. But let's say six months before that, their license was, was expired and you just made sure that their license was um, current. That what you did six months ago, just making sure that the license was current is not the credentialing thing. The credentialing date is when you did a full review of their credentialing file. Um, the privileging date is the day that privileges were granted. So let's say you began the process in um, May to, for credentialing. And if you have the board appoint, um, the board signed off in June. So the credentialing date would be May, the privileging date would be June. This includes all provider types. So your LIPS, your OLCP and OCSs. Um, it includes, like I said, it includes employed or contracted practitioners. So before where you could rely on your contracts for credentialing and privileging to um, happen through the contracted entity. Now you have to reach out to that entity and say, when was the last time they were credentialed and privileged or contracted providers. When were the last time they were credentialed and privileged? So HRSA wants to see that that the date, those the most recent credentialing date and the most recent privileging date, that all occurred within the last two years. Right. This is this is very significant because the way it worked until now was if you contracted with the hospital as an example for them to provide you with staff. All you needed to do was have magic language in your agreement that says they're going to credential and privilege the people. You didn't need to know any details about it. Now, essentially, you don't have to have, well, you don't have, to have the file, but you need to know when it was last done and confirm that it was within the last two years. So, um, let's see. So, at first, also, I was confused because, uh, let me grab the PAL. So, if you look at the PAL, it lists out all the credentialing requirements um, underneath the credentialing list. So I said, just to confirm, the only thing that you are looking for on the credentialing list are those bullets noted. So the ones that are included on the slide. And they said, yes, they're not looking for the date BLS, you know, the date of the BLS or completion of the query. All they're looking for are those bullets noted, but their expectation is that when you're saying the most recent credentialing date was May 2020 or May 2022, that everything included in the credentialing requirements was done on May 2022. So your list only has to include um, those items. Okay, so Sandy, given it's time, you want to just jump to claims management and see if there's anything, is there anything new in claims management? Yeah, no. Um, so, oh, did you want to talk about our- Sure, oh, yes. So just really quickly, uh, we've been approached by many FQATs who had problems with credentialing. And so now we offer through our sister company called Garfunkel Health Advisors, credentialing services, whether it's a review of your what you're doing, um, or it can, it could be doing the entire credentialing and privileging pa package for you and storing all the records for you. If you want more information, you know, contact one of us. 
Okay. So for claims management, there's um, there's nothing new, but I just want to make sure that when you submit your claims management process, include those two bullets or the, you know, that as part of the process that you're preserving health center documents and that any service of process is sent to um, the Office of General Counsel. So what does that mean? If you have notice of an actual or potential claim or complaint, you have to make sure that the department involved doesn't get rid of documents. So you're preserving documents that could potentially help you in defending the action. And if you receive um, a complaint, you're immediately forwarding it to the Office of General Counsel because there's timeframes um, attached to the complaint. Like when you have to answer actions, you have to take. Um, this is not new. If you have a closed claim, you have to, you know, include a description of what you've done to mitigate against any claims happening in the future. Right, and that's, that's only for closed claims, not open claims in response to somebody's question. Right. Okay. Um, and this is all new. Okay, so I know so, I mean, I'll, I'll old, I'll old. <laughs> go ahead. No, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, just to answer a couple of the questions, because we are a, little, a couple of minutes over. Um, in your risk management plan, you, someone asked about listing all of the trainings that you provide. And the answer is, that's great if people are doing the trainings and you're making sure you provide them each year. I would not want to list something that you're not, you know, you're not necessarily doing each year, right? You could say then the trainings can include any of you know, some of the following rather than saying they must unless you actually do all of that. Uh, someone asked a question about nurse practice, about students. I think it applies to all students. As a general course, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get state by state, but in many states, students are not allowed to touch the patient, so they don't need to be credentialed, and they, and they come from the school, so the school should be taking care of paperwork for that, and that should be in your contract with the school. Um, someone mentioned that BOS is not new, and I, I guess the answer is that BOS until now was not new, it was not required for everybody. It was like you could decide by yourself who was going to have BOS. You have to always have someone on site who had BOS, but not necessarily everybody, and now they seem to be saying everybody. Um, someone asked a question about OB a contractor. OB contractor is considered to be primary care for these purposes, so yes, they can, if they are directly you're paying them a direct 1099, not through an entity, then they can be covered. And just to be clear, if, you, if you're hiring Jeff ADES MD, and instead of paying Jeff ADES, you pay Jeff ADES MD PC, you know, an entity that I own, even though I'm the only person, generally will not have coverage for that. Um, I think, I don't want to say we caught every question. When we talk about the board here, we mean the governing board overall. Um, and I think if you don't have any claims in the past five years, you don't have to include anything that you do not need to. And the one about patient satisfaction, um, that should be reported in risk management as well. I believe that was one of the elements of, yeah, so, um, that was one of the elements in your annual, annual report as well. So that's one of those areas where it's like intersecting patient satisfaction, patient grievances. You should be reporting it um, for, for both purposes, really. Okay, so last thing, if anyone who's not signed up, again, next week we are doing a presentation, same time next Thursday on virtual OSBs. I will tell you that many things have changed including, and I'll give you a sneak preview, HRSA is now role, doing a beta test on a one-day OSB. So tune in next week for more detail about that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.